and their uh, companies have contributed to two excellent demos that we are showing in our booth in uh, Hall 2, stand uh, M61. So after the show is over, please visit us there to uh, see the excellent demos of deployable 5G VRAN systems as well as open source systems they have put together. Let me start this uh, fireside chat with a question to uh, Accelercom, Rob Barnes. So your company has focused on acceleration products for 5G VRAN and VORAN systems. What do you see as the challenges and opportunities in this uh, space for you, for your company? Thank you very much for inviting me here. Um, I mean, just starting a little bit with the opportunities and then, and then move on to the challenges. Um, you know, we've talked about it all today, you know, this morning. ORAN is actually causing a disruption in the market. You know, the, the operators are really behind ORAN and driving that. Um, what it's actually meaning, though, is there's a need to have interoperability, but equally not lose the performance. Because if you can't push the performance while keeping interoperability, you're going to you know, struggle dislodging other players in the market, so it's really important to do that. So that, that is causing huge opportunity, though, and, and that in itself. And then what's coming with that is 5G. Don't think of 5G as a single instance. It's a, it's a moving feast all the time. You've got multiple numerologies in 5G. And so what you're going to see is the needs for flexibility, which is you know, where the FPGA brings us that opportunity as well, so there's a lot from that. Just a quick one on the challenges is APIs. Hey, there's a real dichotomy here, right? Everybody wants to use standard off-the-shelf products, but they all want to differentiate. It's really, really hard, so you just need multi-levels of APIs and, and make sure the software works for that, so that's, that's the challenge. Yeah. Thanks, Rob. The next question will ask uh, to Raymond Knopp. Professor Knopp, you know, what is your vision for this open air interface initiative? Where do you see this going in the future? And what do you see as the future of this open source system? Okay, um, well, it's, it's a very long answer to that question. Um, I'll try and make it as, as uh, concise as possible. I mean, open, uh, the open air interface started as a grassroots grassroots movement in, in, in academia. We were working with partners like Manu and, and others around the world to, to build tools so that the, the, the academic world could innovate in 3 gpp systems. Um, it's grown, and especially in, in the context of 5G, it's grown to the point where it's a, a set of tools that are usable by, you know, by companies like Xilinx to be able to put together demos that, that, that we did here in the world of commerce. Anything going forward, uh, we have to bring those two worlds together um, so that the academics can actually influence the, the, the evolution of 5G systems. And where it's really going now um, in 5G is the cloud native aspect. Uh, open interface today is really a set of tools that can be deployed on standard cloud infrastructure. Um, and the, the, the collaboration now that we're starting with Xilinx and MP um, is really going to bring the accelerators into the mix. Uh, and I think there are a lot of challenges in, in putting together real-time systems for doing RAN combined uh, with uh, accelerators on conventional cloud infrastructure. I think that's really where we're going in the, in the, in the short term. Um, in the longer term, towards 6G, um, Eurocom really is a, uh, involved in innovation in, in, in algorithms, uh, not just in, in, in the implementation technologies. And, and I think where, where, where Open Air Interface is today is, is really at a crossroads when it's coming towards, uh, towards 6G. I think we made the right decisions in terms of how you do open source in a 3G context. It's not a simple thing. Um, and I think we're, we're seeing a lot of um, movement now for some of the big 3GP players when it comes to 6G and the notion of open RAM. And I think what open air interface has is the right solution for doing that when it comes to, to 6G. Thank you, Raymond. And I'll uh, move on to uh, Manu Gosain. Manu, you have led this effort for open source 5G systems and 4G systems in the United States. What do you see as the motivation for OpenARX Labs, and where do you see this going? Thanks for the question, and uh, thanks for inviting. Uh, good morning to everyone. So, uh, again, building on top of what, what Raymond has said, you know, uh, as a background in academia, we really wanted to provide a basic foundation for uh, academics to really flourish. And 5G has actually lowered the barrier of entry for uh, uh, academics primarily, given the context of cloud-native access, given the uh, 
given access to containers uh, and given access to actually software implementations that have actually been built by the open source community. Um, measure or a yardstick by which open source ecosystems are measured are, is by adoption and by developer contributions. And what we saw was open air interface was leading in all of these uh, fronts. So we also saw a need in the community, and the community primarily is industry R&D, uh, academia, as well as the federal ecosystem. So we wanted to coalesce all of the contributions and the needs and the requirements and be a central coordinating entity point uh, for the US and for the global uh, market to essentially be able to take the open air interface software stack and essentially make it performant, reliable, and stable. And these are some of the pain points that obviously anybody who, uh, in the audience who's ever worked with an open source ecosystem or tried to productize it or sort of take it to the market has experienced. So the goal here is essentially to uh, have a multiplicative effect for every single dollar of investment and every hour of development contribution time, leveraging the infrastructure provided by partners like AMD Xilinx to essentially come out and develop a 5G in a box solution. And we're working with obviously commercial partners like Madison, et cetera, because it's a very componentized approach. It's a mix and match approach. Uh, we want, again, in a similar spirit to a mobile network operator, any kind of private uh, enterprise or an industry R&D lab to be able to instantiate uh, an open source uh, ecosystem and then flourish and take it into different directions for 3 gpp release 16, 17, and 18. So we are very committed to uh, uh, supporting our federal ecosystem partners like the Department of Defense, uh, as well as the National Science Foundation in implementing SiteLink, in implementing mobile integrated access and backhaul, and essentially trying to be in lockstep. And of, of course, ORAN is the flavor of the day, so you know there is, there is complete uh, commitment and support to do this uh, work. So we want to bring the resources, the intellectual capital, and the partnerships, and obviously leading from the front. Thank you very much. Munish, you are in a very unique position. You have your presence in both camps, in the uh, proprietary deployable systems, as well as the open, open interface, open RAN systems. So given your position, what do you see as the opportunity for VRAN versus open RAN you know, uh, in the commercial? Thank you, Raghu. I think that's a great question. And I would say, Let's also understand the need for uh, any kind of proprietoriness which is coming into the ecosystem. So the first part of it in the best of the, let's say the ideal world, everything is open. So which caters to the deployable solutions which are scalable all across, so probably catering to, let's say, macro deployments. But if we really look at some of the other uh, form factors which leads to uh, optimizations on different platforms. That's where the need on specific interfaces comes in from a proprietoriness. One of the examples could be the interface between the layer two and the layer one. While the interface is, let's say, the split six interface, it is standard defined. But still, in those standards, does it cater to all the optimizations or all the differentiation that each of the platform wants to bring on the table is getting addressed today or not? That is why we see that with every layer one that we do interop with, while on the face of it, 90, 95% is copy compliant, but there's still 5% of uh, proprietary nature uh, of implementation, which is also coming from the implementation or the optimization which can be achieved on that uh, platform. Uh, on the other side, we have also seen a similar uh, scenario with respect to different architectures. For example, when you go to uh, a small cell kind of architecture, and you go to probably a residential small cell where the bomb becomes super important. And then, you know, every CPU cycle that you spend becomes very important. So in a, in a use case where the CU and DU are collapsed together, having F1 probably becomes a overkill. So we have seen that that leads to uh, proprietoriness in the, uh, and removing those interfaces, but specifically for those applications. But we also see, especially uh, use cases around similar to uh, on the management side, uh, it also depends upon brownfield deployments versus greenfield deployments. So existing deployments, for example, let's say people have 4G, which is already deployed, and similar to the small cell TR69 interface, which is defined in, um, in the, uh, for 4G, there is no standard for 5G today, for TR69. 
So there is still a need to extend that to cater to small cell deployments because people today have already deployed management systems which are based on uh, uh, TL69. So these are some of the use cases where we have seen that while most of the cases the approach to the market or approach to implementation is still based on open standards, but uh, depending upon the application, depending upon the platform, there may be bits and pieces of proprietariness coming into the implementation as well. Thank you, Munish. So I'll uh, back to you, Rob. My next question to you is, uh, as we see this ORAN, you know, uh, and VRAN systems evolve, the next big evolution is from this leukocyte based acceleration to inline acceleration. So how do you see your company adapt to this changing need for inline acceleration? And can you briefly share your roadmap to address uh, this new opportunity, if you will? Yeah, thank you. I think it's a really quite interesting. Everyone, you know, it's, again, it does go a bit back to the APIs that are available, right? So the look aside things working quite well because of the uh, working group six of the ORAN Alliance, got the AAL, which allows you to do the LVPC, and you can do that up to sort of travel bot level. There are steps I think you can get to, or the, the, you know, the industry can get to before they get to the complete in my five, which I think is absolutely the, the, the way to go. But first, why don't we look at moving things like modulation as you take the complete push channel? And you can move the modulation down onto the FPGA on the accelerator card as well, which will you know, reduce your bandwidth on your on your PCI by two port clear back to two. So that you know, driving standards really important to allow that differentiation of offloading more than just the LDPC. But then absolutely we are doing a development of a complete inline fi um, where actually what you find there is the complete level one uh, protocol stack running on an embedded CPU, typically those those found inside your FPGAs. And if you combine that with the data channel being hardened hard through the FPGA, then you can actually make your software load you know, much more usable in those sort of embedded environments. And, and the nice thing that that brings with, when you do that is you get pretty clean interfaces because you're now at the ECP level or you're at the your FAPI level. So at that level, it does make that, that interface and interoperability a lot, a lot easier. So, yeah, we're, we're doing this business development. We'll have demos of complete files, you know, middle of this year. and hopefully early access releases towards the end of the year. And there's two splits, right? There's, we'll start with probably a split six, but equally, very easy, a split seven two just drops out of that implementation. So it's really where, where Excelcom's going. And I think the other key thing to how to differentiate 3DB game. So we've got a very clever algorithm around the equalization technique, which does give us a 3DB game, just modeled it in a port in Hungary, and um, you're basically getting a 30% capex and opex saving on the deployment in the port, port. so you know, I think uh, spectral efficiency is really important. Thank you. So with this new thing called ORAN, which introduced open interfaces, that's how it started. But very quickly, the ORAN consortium started defining a whole new architecture with a real-time system and a non-real-time system and also a near real-time system. And importantly, they have introduced this new thing called radio intelligent controller, where which can be used to uh, integrate intelligence in the sense of uh, you know artificial intelligence based, uh, learning based, um, sound systems, as well as in many times controlling the hardware or manipulating the hardware based on this intelligence collected over a period of time. For instance, managing the massive MIMO beams. So my next question is to uh, Professor Knopp. How do you see your open air interface support this ORAN consortium interfaces as well as all the new architectures that they're putting together? Is there any effort going on towards that? Well, um, in open air interface, we've been following the ORAN lines from the very beginning of, uh, of ORAN. And of course, when we started designing the, um, the 5G system, and even before the with, with the existing open air interface 4G, we were already experimenting with some of the interfaces in order to, to integrate a RIC inside the uh, inside the architecture. Um, and you know, it, open air interface is really about all the interfaces, uh, and and we have to be able to support the the, uh, the, 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 the community with everything that's out there. Um, so little by little, all of this is coming into OAI. Uh, so today we have an E2 interface. We we, we have a the the, the 
essence of the 7.2, which we're starting to do interoperability testing with commercial devices. Um, so all of this is definitely coming. Um, you know, what's important with respect to what, what uh, you were just saying, Martin, is also look at the interfaces that are not in the world. And, and you as a community like uh, Open Air Interface to start prototyping these interfaces that should actually be coming in to control the massive micro array uh, that we have, that you have on your stand. That's, that's the strength of Open Air Interface and where partnerships with companies like Xamos are really, and, and AP, are really, really to bring these things into the uh, into the ecosystem. Thank you very much. I'll ask the same question to uh, Manu next. And uh, in addition to that, is there any plans at uh, Open Air X Labs to contribute directly to this open source initiative? You know, uh, managing the open source ta talent available in the US to contribute to this uh, database. Uh, absolutely. Thanks, Raghu. So I'll take a different approach or uh, add and enhance what Raymond was saying. Primarily what we're looking at is, an, and, and the previous speaker also mentioned this, is around the data uh, and any of it, right? So any um, XAP, RAP, RAM optimization, any AI only stands on, on the data that's made available to us. And, and here's where, again, credit where it's due is the ability to actually extract that level of information from a AMD processor or from a Zagos FPGA really gives you the opportunity to really extract parameters that you need and build the kind of service model, the KPMs, the, the radio control that's required uh, to actually influence uh, what's available. Credit where it's due to the Radisys team that's going to contribute the, the radio intelligent controller to the open source, uh, to the OSC, the Open Software Community. That's actually been really helpful to our community, uh, to OER, to be able to actually enhance the XAP startups that have been developed, to implement the E2 interfaces. But for us, we really are going to see value in implementing the, the AI algorithms, uh, the, the inference that's required, the RAN optimization work that we can do. And that's what we are sort of you know, uh, supporting as part of OpenRx Lab. So that's the AI uh, kind of flavor. What we also see is uh, additional existing investments from the National Science Foundation, which actually invests in foundational and applied research actually helps us drive the contributions back into open air interface. So there are multiple community infrastructure projects, basic fundamental research projects, and then again, tapping into the resource, uh, research pool that we have with my colleagues uh, all across the US ecosystem, uh, developing the coordination with the Raymond and team uh, out in France actually has been quite beneficial. And you know, we're reaping the results in the form of demonstrations at your point. Thank you. So Manish, on these open RAN systems, how do you see the ecosystem evolve to deliver commercially viable systems or commercially deployable systems? And I would say it has three steps. Uh, number one step with respect to specifications coming out. And I would say ORAN, uh, again, from a specs point of view, that there's excellent work being done out there. Defining all the interfaces and in fact, filling up all the loop loops that have been identified, or as the, uh, all these different vendors that are coming together, they're testing, the specs are even evolving today, especially on the E2 side, uh, which has a lot to be done. I would say 2022 is the year for uh, break of the E2. Uh, but there's also a lot of these plug fests which have been happening, they have been helping uh, between different vendors, establishing interoperability already out there. Again, the next step, uh, second step would be operator-driven uh, consortiums. So operators, uh, and again, you know, one is if you look at something like TIP, which brings all the operators together, brings all these requirements from operators, and then feeds into uh, vendor community. But at the same time, different operators bringing in a lot of different vendors together, and then uh, enforcing or in a way colla creating collaboration in terms of interoperability between different interfaces, right? So maybe it could be in a way that create uh, two or three vendors for every component which want, they want to be open in their uh, network, and then establish interoperability, establish standard test cases to that matter. And this is again coming from uh, in uh, or end community as well, with a specific test and integration focus group as well. So, but the most important aspect which I think still needs to be improved in this segment would be the role of SI. And 
in the role of SI, it is not just about testing everything end to end. And because again, implementations between two different nodes or um, implementation of the standards as each of the vendors have understood and have implemented, the, uh, the SI may not be able to figure out or they may be able to still find out that what is the problem between the two, but they will not be able to make the changes on these different vendors, right? So we need a little bit of openness out there and the SI role to also scale up in terms of not only just doing the testing part of it, but also working very closely with standards and making sure that the implementation or the understanding of those standards is what is implemented in the vendor community. And last but not least, but I would also say, in a way, the government contribution would also be needed in this segment. And it could start with something in terms of dedicating implementations or uh, sponsoring or maybe also subsidizing part of open networks to be deployed in the countries. That would actually really lead to confidence building in terms of how open network can really compete with uh, the networks that are existing today. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to open uh, the questions to the audience. If any of you want to ask uh, questions of the panel, uh, there's an opportunity to do so. Anybody from the audience? Okay. Um, so, I have a few questions for, uh, for the panel. Um, Rob, coming back to you, what do you see as the big challenge that your company faces in you know providing these solutions for these interoperable open open systems, ORAN systems? Yeah, I think for us particularly, you know, we're, we're working in IP business, you know, and um, the, the market does need so much fle flexibility and configurability. So for us to be able to sort of design the right product that get, is most optimally designed to give the best performance and so on, but also enables that configuration space to go ahead and implement it. And, you know, it, it is very easy to end up either you know, going down and becoming a services company or building a product that just doesn't quite meet all the requirements that it needs to do. So that challenge is actually is finding that sort of sweet spot between the flexibility and the configurability and, and creating a reusable product that you can then benefit from the cost sharing model, which is what IP is all about. Like, so Raymond, could you elaborate more on your initiatives towards 6G? You know, as far as the research community and the standardization community is concerned, 5G is done and dusted, you know, it's in deployment mode. So they move on, they take the first steps towards 6G. So what is, uh, and that's where you come in. What are your, what are your thoughts on 6G? Okay, so what, what, what I really think about um, the road towards 6G, um, if, if I think back the history of Open Air Debates, when we, when we first designed our 4G implementation, uh, something that was ready to experiment with came out maybe a year after commercial networks. 5G came out slightly before commercial networks. With 6G, uh, I think what we have the opportunity in doing is actually integrating this prototyping phase into the definition of 6G. And that's where we need help from companies like AMD Xilinx to find ways to, to really prototype alongside the standardization process. We have to get involved with ITU early, we have to get involved with 3GPP early. And as I said before, I think when it comes to open source uh, and 3GPP, um, OAI is the right way to do it. Uh, people look at the details of the way uh, the software is licensed, it is compatible with 3GPP. In the prototyping phase, it is compatible with standardization. And we have to exploit that together. Um, and if I can say one other thing, the, the openness combined with um, prototyping in this way would be one, one way to guarantee a global 6G standard, which is in some sense threatened at this point. Thank you. I'll ask the same question to Manu. You know, you are also leading the power initiative, Platforms for Advanced Wireless Research. As part of that, and all the government efforts going on in the US, how do you see the move to 6G? How do you see the move to 6G? Yep, sure. So um, again, right, the, the process has already started. IMT 2030, there is a roadmap. ITU, uh, you know, working group 5G is essentially defining what the requirements are. The US position 
uh, is, is set. So again, the requirements phase is, is being defined, right? So in WRC 23, there's going to be, you know, they're, they're going to know what uh, are the key enabling technologies that are going to form the basis of 6G. Couldn't agree more with Raymond that we actually need the open source ecosystem to be in lockstep in the requirements phase. Because if you back out from 2030 to release 21 or so, which is where we would expect the first sort of flavor of uh, 6G to be vetted by 3GPP, you actually, it, the time is actually now for the fundamental research to happen. So whether it be looking at spectrum fr frontiers, about 95 gigahertz, terahertz, sub-terahertz systems, how do you actually, I mean, the, the challenge is scales, right? What we're looking at in, in the context of massive mind or millimeter waves, the impact, and obviously nobody understands it better than EMB Xilinx, because you provide systems that enable the research there. So we're, we're essentially uh, trying to chart a path. I also wear a hat as the uh, FCC Technical Advisory Council 6G co-chair. So we're actually trying to define what 6G is going to be, and we uh, anticipate publishing a white paper at the end of the year. And we will absolutely keep that in mind uh, for our federal stakeholders to start to invest now in the open source ecosystem, in the requirements phase, so that we can actually have a global standard, but also selfishly stake the claim for an automatic innovation. Thank you. So, uh, Nish, you touched upon SI, system integration, right? And you have a very unique role to play there, bringing together all these diverse systems and making them work well. <coughs> How do you see this effort of system integration for Radisys? You know, what challenges do you face when you run into uh, system integration for a particular operator, for instance? So, um, I would say, first of all, before the system integration, the software that we offer in the market, it is actually at the right, at the heart of openness. So, all the open interfaces which are coming out, they touch us in some other way. So, whether we talk about the network uh, interface, or the management interface or towards the, the RIC interface, towards the layer one, and even within the CU and DU split interfaces coming uh, in. At the same time, I would say even the 7.2 split in a way also uh, touches or impacts us from an implementation perspective. But the most important aspect that comes in is from a commercialization aspect of open interfaces coming in and also competing with the existing proprietary networks or the solutions out there, both with respect to cost and also with respect to being able to offer the same scale and capacity within the open environment, bringing all the vendors together and making sure also that end-to-end -end implementation is flawless. The understanding of all the vendors on the standard is flawless. That is the only way we can compete with uh, these proprietary networks. So that is the perspective that I think uh, the industry needs to take up and all the vendors again uh, in SI role in terms of ensuring that the understanding of the standard and the implementation follows uh, so that end-to-end -end systems can achieve that level of performance. Thank you. With that, we bring this uh, fireside chat with this fine panel to a conclusion. Please visit us uh, at uh, Hall 2, booth 61 to see these two uh, excellent demos of VRAM systems, both uh, proprietary as well as open source, implemented on AMD platforms, AMD servers, and accelerated with uh, Xilinx Telco accelerated cards, Xilinx AMD now. So uh, these are showing, and we'll be, we'll be around to answer any questions. So be free to stop by. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.